We arrived late last night through all of those storms, but we're here and I'm just so privileged to be a part of the Breadbeckers and Sue was actually, she came to Richmond last February in the cold part of the winter to be a part of our video series, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But um, I just have to ask you, have you ever had one of those days? Well, two years ago, I had a really bad day. I ended up in an emergency room with a chest tube. And I ended up experiencing a total lung collapse. Well, that caught me totally unaware. So I started asking a lot of questions. How could this be happening? What's going on? You know, because up until that point, I had a lot of energy. I was teaching healthy living classes. I was, you know, reaching out and helping others, you know, discover, you know, the health that God intended for them. But yet there I was, laying there with a chest tube. And so the doctors decided to ask me a lot of questions. And that became a little bit humorous. They would say, well, how many surgeries have you, did, have you had? And I'm like, well, none. And well, what medications do you take? Well, none. And they're like, no, even like over the counter. I'm like, no, I don't take any medications. I'm, you don't understand. I, I, was, I was healthy. I had a lot of energy. I felt great. I don't know why. I just can't breathe right now. But, and so they just kept asking lots and lots of questions. And then one of the questions they asked, they said, well, what about what you do? What do you do for a living? And I was like, well, um, I teach healthy living classes so people can avoid the hospital. And to which the, he responded, well, so how's that working for you? <laughs> I'm like, well, not very well at the moment. And um, as he was asking these questions, the x-ray technician came in, and he was overhearing the conversation. And he just kind of chuckled to himself. And he says, yeah, well, it appears to me my choice of fried chicken and candy bars is much healthier than your choice of healthy eating. Well, as I said to him, well, let's check back again in about five years. And let's see where we both are, because things aren't always as they seem to appear. And so x-rays and CAT scans, they couldn't figure out what was going on. Everything was inconclusive. Well, I ended up getting admitted to a step-down unit, and I had this nurse, and, and he was very new. So that meant it took longer to get admitted. And so once again, went through all of the questions, you know, surgeries, you know, medications, da 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 But the one he got stumped on the most was the medications. He says, no, really, I need to know, I need to put in the computer here what medications you take. And I said, well, you need to know, I don't take any. He's like, no, anything, like over the counter, you know, once a month, whatever. I'm like, no, I just don't take medications. I haven't taken medications in over eight years. And he says, well, he looked at the computer, and he looked back at me, and he says, that's not an option. <laughs> He says, I'm just going to have to mark, check it that patient denies taking medication. Isn't that interesting? I'm now in denial with everything else that's going on. It's like, OK, well, I said, well, that's the truth. And so um, throughout the night, you know, he also asked, he says, so what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I teach healthy living classes. So people can, you know, just feel better, have energy, you know, have vitality. And he thought that was kind of interesting. And so he finished up and he said, oh, you can, go, you, can go, you can get some rest now. Yeah, OK. And so then a little bit later, he came in. And he was kind of checking the tubing and all this stuff. And, and I said, you know, I'm awake. You have, if you want to talk, you know, I'm here. And he says, well, I do have some questions for you. I said, well, sure. He says, um, I deal with a lot of acid reflux. And I really don't like the prescription. I was wondering if you had some ideas that I could do. Like, OK, so I work, we worked through those. And then he says, oh, and, and my wife, she's dealing with a lot of constipation all the time. And we just don't really like the Miralax and all of those other answers. Do you have anything that she could do? Well, Sue would be very proud of me. I told her about the bread and, and the digestive system. I did like a 10-minute version of Sue's two-hour bread talk, you know, as quick as I could get the words out. And so I explained all that. And then he says, well, and my kids, they have a lot of allergies and asthma. <laughs> And I'm like, the question just coming, kept coming one after another. And I'm like, OK, Lord, um, it appears we're expanding my consulting business right here in the hospital. And so finally, at the end of the night, I had to ask him, I said, you know, why are you asking me all these questions? 
I said, I, you know, I am kind of the one laying here, and obviously something's not right. I've, obviously something's wrong, but yet you're asking me questions about all of these health problems. And he says, well, he says, I see a lot of patients come through here. And even though he was a new nurse, he wasn't new to the nursing field. He'd been in working in the hospitals for, for like 15 years and with his clinicals and all of that. And he says, I see a lot of people come through here. He says, but I don't normally see someone who looks healthy and, has, and is not on any medications and hasn't been on medications for over eight years. He said, I had to know your secrets. And isn't that beautiful that God allows us every situation we're in to share with them, with the people around us, what God's doing in our life? Because when he asked, I told him, it's all about biblical nutrition, not about what's the latest fad going on. And so God gave me more and more opportunities to share that. But I need to be honest with you at the same time. In the middle of all that, throughout the night, I started questioning myself too. Lord, why is this happening? You know, what could be going on? Was I teaching something that was wrong? You see, when I asked the doctors this question, he said, oh, it could be asthma or a hole in your lung or cancer. I'm like, okay. And I'll accept whatever God brings my way. But still I had to know, am I teaching what's right? Am I missing something? Is there, are people even going to want to hear, hear from me again, you know, with my health failing like this? But God brought to mind a verse in that, during that night, and it was Romans 8, 28. And I'm sure many of you have this memorized. And it says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. I knew I loved the Lord. And I knew by studying his scripture that we are all called according to his purpose. But the rest of the verse, I didn't get I had no idea how it fit in, but it didn't matter. What mattered was that I just kept trusting him through every situation. Well, within 18 hours, I know that's not a very long time in your normal life, but when you're in the hospital, 18 hours seems like forever. So with that, within 18 hours, my lung responded, and I was out of the hospital. And I was like, okay, good. That's behind me. Okay, whatever you had in that, Lord, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. Now let's just move on and forget about it, you know. And then within 30 days... I was getting ready for my very first 10K. And I can still remember the person talking me into this. And, and so I was getting ready. It was January 1st. And you know how we are January 1st. You know, all the feasting is behind us and, and all of that. And, and so I had bundled up. You know, I live in Virginia. Um, not quite as cold as Missouri, where I'm from. But I was, got all bundled up, got my mittens on, my hat on, and my coat on, and my tennis shoes. I was going to, okay, I am ready to get ready for this 10K. The 10K was going to be at the end of March. So I head out to the front door, open the door. It's like, okay, too cold. <laughs> I don't do cold. So it's like, okay, take off the hat, take off the mittens, you know, take off the jacket, everything. It's like, okay, I'll go to the treadmill. <laughs> I'll try that. So sure enough, I get on the treadmill, and I start off with a jog, and then I go into a run. And I was running along just like one or two minutes, barely into it. And then all of a sudden, I had this chest pain. And if you've never felt a lung collapse, it's like someone stabs you in the back with a knife. And it's like, oh, no. I wanted to blame it on the treadmill. <laughs> but I knew right then and there my lung had collapsed again. And I was like, oh, I got to go back to the hospital again. And the doctor and I didn't get along very well. And I got to go face him. And sure enough, I went back to the hospital, another chest tube. And this time, I had to consent to surgery. Well, after surgery, the doctor came out with the most amazed look on his face, which is a good sign. And um, he came out, and he says, you're not going to believe what we found. I'm like, OK, good. We're coming to some answers here, finally, because once again, all of the lab tests were coming back inconclusive. He says, you know, I've looked at your lab tests. I've looked at the CAT scans, and we couldn't find anything wrong. But in surgery, I went on a hunt. Now, today we're going to talk about a treasure hunt, but this has nothing to do with that, OK? So he said, I went on a hunt. He says, your lungs are as healthy as a newborn baby. They're as pink as can be. He says, and your heart and your liver, he says, all of that is extremely healthy. He said, I found that you have a possible birth defect in your diaphragm that was causing the pressure to force your lung to collapse. So every time I was working out is when this would happen. And I was actually had noticed that it had been happening quite often, but I could usually recover quickly. 
And sure enough, with those words, God confirmed in my heart that what I'm teaching is valid. God's word will always be the truth, no matter what situation we come into. It means I'm not going to give up on what he's teaching us. So I am a, what I've labeled myself as a biblical nutrition consultant. I lead people on a treasure hunt to discover God's treasure in health. And it is probably one of the most unique Bible studies you could ever go through. But our main verse for this journey is Proverbs, and I, I've had it memorized for years now. I just totally left my mind. Proverbs 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Now this verse starts with the word taste. And I know we've all been experiencing that word really well in our lifetime, right? And some of us more than others. But did you know when you go back to the original writing of this scripture, the word taste, it means to discover. And the word see, taste and see, the word see it means to experience. This verse is saying, discover and experience that the Lord is good. Now, do you recognize these are action verbs? These are saying, get, get involved. God's saying, you know, I just don't want you out this back there on the sidelines just watching things take place in front of you. He's saying, I want you discovering and experience the good that I have for you. And that's what this treasure hunt is all about, discovering and experiencing the good that God has given us. And you know, not only is he good, everything he's designed, everything he's created is good. And that includes the cells in your body. And Dr. Cooey, I know he's watching by, by the internet, and if he could get up here, he could just do wonders with the cell and share so much information with you. But you know, have you guys ever wanted a maid in your house? I would love to have a maid someday. But did you know our, each one of our trillions of cells have a maid cleaning out the waste every day and cleaning it up so it, so it can work good for you? That's part of the good design that God's, God's, God's done for us. You know, he created our body in his image. Everything is good. Now, the second part of that verse says, blessed is the man who trusts in him. Some versions are going to say, take refuge. Have you ever been put on a diet plan and you just feel like you need to just crawl up in God's lap and just put it, say, Lord, just put your arms around me and just help me through this? Well, through the treasures of healthy living, yes, you can crawl up on Jesus' lap and just say, Lord, I'm just going to take refuge in you, but this is not a diet plan. This is just God's word, and we're going to apply it and see, how, see what, what God's design is. So that is our, our main verse for this journey. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. So let me just ask you, are you really ready to discover and experience the treasure that God has for you? Because if you are, then we're ready for the journey. Okay? So we're going to take four steps on this journey. The first step is this. We need to discover where are we with our health. Now, if you were to think of one word that describes your health, what would it be? You might even want to write it down on your notepad, and I'm, I'm excited that so many of you are taking notes. What would that word be? How would you describe your health today? Now, let me ask you a second question. How would you, what word would you like to use to describe the health you want? What would that word be? Many times when, I, when I'm leading people and teaching them, they'll say, well, I want energy. I want vitality. And some people would say, I just want no pain. <laughs> but what about the words glorifying, rejoicing, praiseworthy? Have you ever thought that your health could be glorifying? Well, we're going to look at that today. So let's just look at how we're going to take this journey so step one is you need to determine where you are today with your health. For my husband and I, we were overweight, pre-diabetic, heart problems. We've already had cancer in our household. You know, our prescription bottles just seemed like they were multiplying in the cabinet. You know, we were living an American processed life with problems and prescriptions. And eventually we said, enough is enough. I personally, I, 
the Holy Spirit just kept tugging at my heart, Annette, I've got a better plan for you. And I just kept looking and looking, where is it, where is it? He's like, and each time we'd, we'd run into another complication, Annette, I've got a better plan for you. I'm like, I'm looking, Lord, I'm looking, where is it? Well, finally, when we moved to Richmond, Virginia, I was put in touch with a mentor, and, and she shared with me a book by Dr. Rex Russell. And if you've been listening to Sue Becker teach, you're very familiar with this book. It sold millions and millions of copies. It's called What the Bible Says About Healthy Living. And when I studied that and just really started realizing how he, too, had to go back to Scripture to find the treasure that God has for him. And that's where I started. So where is your health today? Where do you want it to be? Okay, that's step one. Step two is... We're going to need a really good map. Have you ever been on a treasure hunt? Don't you need a good map so you know where you're going to end up? You know that little X on the map, like this is where I want to end up? On your GPS, there's like this flag as if we've ended the race. You know, I need, to, I need a good map that's going to lead me where I want to go. Now, your cookbook is not the map you need to follow for this, okay? Even though recipes look really good and those pictures make the, just the dish look scrumptious, that's not going to be our map for this journey. Not that we might not want to use a cookbook along the journey, but that's not going to be our guide. Instead, we need a map that has been proven for years to be the truth. No matter what problem I encounter, I need a map that's going to get me through it. And I need one that's been proven beyond the latest scientific study. <laughs> proven for years. And so the map for our journey, as you probably are already thinking, it's going to be the Bible. The Bible is the map that we're going to use for this journey. And, you know, I have to tell you, I have been in church since the day I was born. And I've learned a lot of good teachings. But I want to encourage you that even though we have great teachers and great preachers and, and Sunday school leaders and all this, I want you to say, I'm going to read it for myself and see what God's Word says to me because that's what I had to do, even though I had some good books. And I've got rows and rows and rows of nutrition textbooks, you know, from college and, and the biblical books from another college and, and all of these health books and just rows and rows. If it doesn't filter through God's Word as truth, it doesn't matter, okay? So everything has to be measured and has to be on the map that we're going to follow for this journey. So the map is going to be our Bible. To give you an example, some of the scriptures, when we started this journey, it seemed like everywhere I turned, the scriptures just started jumping out at me. And it didn't matter if I was in church and it was just a song that was being sung. It was like, oh, the Lord confirmed it there. Or the preacher. And I travel and listen to other preachers as, when I'm speaking, and it's like, and that preacher would, would, would touch my heart right where I was and kept confirming that this is God's plan. Now, one of the verses that I want to share with you is Proverbs 2, verse 6. Because if I'm going to make a journey like this, which totally goes against culture, totally goes against 40 years of what I've been doing, then I'm going to need a lot of wisdom. All right, so Pro Proverbs 2, 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. Don't you love it? <laughs> and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. That's what I needed. Although I appreciate the mentors that God has put in my life, I still need the wisdom from the Lord. All right? For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. That means I can trust in him, like that verse said earlier. And so this is going to be the first step on our map. But i got to tell you, I was very skeptical for a couple reasons. Number one, I've read the Bible. I've been in church, like I said, all my life. But I w never heard sermons on health, okay? I heard sermons on everything else. So what would the Bible teach me about health? And Lord, you know, it doesn't say high blood pressure in here. You know, it doesn't say cholesterol. It doesn't have the word cancer in here. It, says, it doesn't say if you have cancer, do this, this, and this. So this was, I totally had to open up my heart and my mind and say, okay, Lord, I'm trusting you. But I was skeptical. And here's the second reason. Have you ever been afraid to look into Scripture for an answer because if you find it, you got to do it, <laughs> you know? And I was like, oh, I don't know if we can go there yet. But I did. I did, and we, and we have followed it, and it has proven so true. Another verse for our journey is going to be 
um, Psalm 119, verses 92 and 93. And this verse here actually became our life verse. And when you hear it, you'll know why. And it says, If thy law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my afflictions. I will never forget thy precepts, for by them thou hast revived me. We're praying for revival in America, but this is talking about just reviving you. Revival starts with us, right? But sometimes our health can be a hindrance to what we're trying to accomplish. And it also says in the beginning, if thy law had not been my delight, what I had to do personally was to learn to just delight in the Lord, delight in his scripture, and take it the way it says, not try to word it the way I wanted to say. I had to learn to delight in his law. And it says I would have perished in my affliction. You know, high blood pressure, cholesterol problems, cancer, heart disease, obesity, those are signs that we are aging, that we are actually, our cells are dying, and that's why we're you know, showing these symptoms and these problems. And it says I would have perished in my affliction. We were dying in our afflictions. But we learn to delight in his law and apply it. And then as it says, it has revived us. And that's the fun part. Okay, another verse I want to share with you is in back in Proverbs, where it was, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Now this one is really where I'm saying we've got to look for script, to Scripture by our, for ourselves. And it says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, turn away from evil. Okay, let me back up. I started mid-sentence mid there. Let me go back to verse 5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. And then here's the clincher. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Did you hear that? Are you ready for your bones to take you dancing? and not complain afterwards, that's what we want. We want this refreshment. We, but first of all, you have to get the first part of that, though. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So many times we, we, we like, okay, I'm going to come to Scripture for my help, but we kind of bring along these other books. Okay, the Scripture says this, but yeah, but this textbook says this. Or, well, this famous doctor speaker says this. So we kind of have to not lean on what we've been taught everywhere else and only lean on God's word. Because if it's truth, a study will prove it, okay? And even if a study doesn't prove it true, I'm still sticking with God's word because that is the truth, all right? So that is just a key verse for this journey. And I want to share one more verse with you right now. Back in Deuteronomy... And I thought I marked it. We'll see. There it is. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39 and 40. It says, Know therefore today, and take it to heart, that the Lord, he is God, in heaven above and on the earth below. And get this, there is no other. Okay? So you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I am giving you today, that it may go well with you and with your children. And for me, I put in and grandchildren after you that you may live long on the land which the Lord your God has given you for all time did you hear it did you hear that okay he's saying the Lord he is God he knows all we can trust in him and he's saying you know so you shall keep his statutes and his commandments that it may go well with you and your children did you know that children being born today are going to live a shorter life expectancy than children ever have in America? We need to stand up and, and you know, say, not in my home, not in my home, you know, but we need to understand what is going on. What are we passing down to our children? So many people say, well, Annette, you know, it's genetics. Really? I just don't see that. You know, we need to say, is it really genetics? What are we passing down to our children? Some people say, well, my dad had high blood pressure, so I'm going to have high blood pressure, so I'm going to take this pill and eat what I want. <laughs> really? Okay. You know, um, or they say, well, my aunt had breast cancer, I might have breast cancer, you know, genetics. 
we need to ask ourselves, is it truly genetics? Is genetics really the answer? Well, my answer to you is yes, but here's the key. Many times it's the familial gene rather than the other genetics that's involved. And familial gene means this. It's what you're teaching your children more so than what you pass down through them when they were born. It's how are you raising your kids? What kind of meals are you fixing your, for your family? You know, are you leading the processed food life, which is going to lead to problems and prescriptions? It's more of the familial gene. It's more the family traditions than the family genetics. Okay? I want to share with you, you know, a quote out of US, U, U.S. News and World Report. And it's talking about what we're passing down to our children and grandchildren and how our children how the sickness, you know, is getting so bad. It said from 2002 to 2005, pediatric prescriptions for diabetes rose more than 100%. You know, that's, we should wake up and, and, and say, not in my home. Another one, it says overweight youngsters ages 6 to 19 who had high cholesterol indicated a buildup of plaque comparable to that of a typical 45-year-old and they're experiencing heart attacks in their 20s and 30s. Wow. So what are we passing down to our children and our grandchildren? Okay, so we need to be aware of that. So our first step was to discover where are we today with our health and where do we want it to go. Our second step was we needed a good map and we found out that's going to be scripture. It's going to be the Bible. Okay, and then our third step is going to be a compass. We are going to need a compass for this journey. Well, for those of you who have done orienteering or hiking, you know that a compass will keep you on the path. It'll keep you in the direction that you want to go. Well, our compass for this journey and where we need a compass the most is in the grocery store. Would you agree? Okay, we need directional signals in a grocery store to know how to get the good and avoid the counterfeits. Okay, so and sometimes I call those counterfeits lab experiments because that's kind of what they are. Okay, so our compass for this journey is going to be Dr. Rex Russell's three principles. Dr. Rex Russell's wife and his publisher have allowed me the privilege of using these three principles throughout the Treasures of Healthy Living study and also when I speak. And that is just such a blessing because these are, are just perfect principles that will take you through any grocery store, any restaurant, and it's easy to remember. So the first principle is this, eat only the foods that God called food. Simple enough, right? Eat only the foods that God called food. Okay, so what does that mean? Did you know that in the grocery stores across America, there are over 320,000 different edible, human edible items. We're not even counting the dog food and the cat food and all of those treats. Human edible items for you to choose from. You ever wonder why we're so confused? Now, in your typical store, you probably have 40,000 of those choices. But still, is that a lot of choices for you to filter through? Now, you probably are already aware, 75% of those are in altered processed food. So that narrows it down, right? We're down to just 25% of the 40,000. So, okay, so we've got it narrowed down. So principle number one, eat only the foods that God called food. So I want to share with you, out of Genesis 1, and I know you're familiar with the story in Genesis 1, but I just want to reacquaint you with it. So here's what's going on in Genesis 1. Day 1, God created, and he said, it is good, right? Day 2, he creates some more. More pieces of the masterpiece are coming together. He says, it is good. Day three, creates some more. He says it is good. Day four and day five, he continues to create more and more of this masterpiece. And at the end of each day, he says it is good. And day six, he looks at everything he had made and he says it is very good. Have you ever thought about that word good? Well, I went back and looked it up. That good means excellent of its kind. Wow. It also means valuable in estimation. What God has given us is good. 
Why, as I said earlier, everything about him is good. Excellent of its kind, valuable in estimation. So when we look at scripture, when we choose foods that he says, Annette, this is food for you. It's going to be excellent of its kind. My cells are going to take it in and get all excited and they're going to have a party. Have you ever noticed there's a lot of energy when there's a party going on? That's what happens in your cells. Your cells are going to say, oh, we know what to do with this. We're going to take it in. We're, our membranes are going to be just happy as can be. Our, our cells are going to be excited, and they're going to be communicating with, every, with each other, and it's going to be good. But when we eat foods that he didn't design for us, our cells are like, now, what does she expect me to do with that? I don't have anything I can do with that. And then they get really, they're not communicating with one another. There's no energy going on there, is there? Okay, so when we get the good that God designed for us, we get energy. In Genesis 1.29, which is the very first verse in Scripture that talks about what we should eat, it says, Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed on the surface of the earth, and every tree which is fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. This is the beginning of the good that God's designed for you. Now, when I was in grade school, good... I mean, when I was in grade school, we weren't, didn't have the grading scale A, B, C, D, F. Ours was actually E, S, M, I, F. And the E stood for excellent. I knew when I got a paperback that had excellent written up at the top, I knew I had done a good job. I did exactly what that teacher asked for me. And I felt good about it. But when I eat foods... That God designed for me, it's almost like I got this grade report that says, excellent job, Annette, you did good. And my cells are excited and they have energy. And so this is what principle one is all about, eating the foods that God designed for us. Now there's many more scriptures about food, so that's not the only one. There's many more and you'll discover them through the Bible study. Principle number two, eat the foods that God designed for you as close to the way he designed it. In other words, Eat the food before it's been altered beyond recognition, pretty much. As I said, we have a lot of foods in the grocery store to choose from, and this is the part that will hang us up the most. So eat the foods that God designed for food and eat them as close to the way he designed it without any, as little alteration as possible. So i got to tell you this story. This past spring, I was doing like a book tour and a speaking tour, and when I come in to speak, I always have food. I figure if we can fellowship around food and, I can, and your stomach feels good, you're going to be more open to what I have to say. So I was in the produce aisle now shopping for some ingredients that I needed for this class. And I came across the kale. And, I, you know, as you're going through the produce aisle, you're grabbing things, putting it in your cart, grabbing it, putting it in your cart. And I came across the kale. I was getting ready to grab it, put it in my cart. I lifted it up, and I'm like, Oh my goodness, I saw something I've never seen in my entire life. I've read about it, I knew what it was, and I looked at it and I was like, so excited. So I called the produce guy, I said, come here. I don't know what he thought, <laughs> but I said, come here, I'm gonna show you something. I said, look at this kale. Do you see that delicate yellow flower on that kale leaf, on that plant? It was no bigger than my fingernail, but it had four yellow petals, and they were shaped in a cross. And I was so excited. I said, do you see that little flower on that plant? And he says, yeah. And I said, do you know what that represents? No. I said, this represents, this is the kale plant, and it's part of the cruciferous family, and there's 12 of them, and they're the most healing, health-promoting vegetables you can eat. They'll help prevent disease. They'll help you when you have disease, and they're just, they're from the cruciferous family, and cruciferous means that the petals resemble a cross, which is the crucifix. Isn't that great? I said, not only that, the same cross that represents, that's represented here represents when Jesus died on the cross and the healing that I can have when I, when I believe in him and accept him, and not only that, but this plant represents the same healing. Isn't that the most exciting, precious story you've ever heard in the produce aisle? Yes. And he just kind of stared at me. I said, well, have a good day. <laughs> and I walked on. But as I, I put it in my cart, and I'm going through the story, and I'm just looking at that delicate yellow flower. It's like, Lord, that is just too good. 
you are so great to me. And the excitement kept building as I'm walking through the aisles and I'm like, Lord, I can't contain this any longer. And so I finally get to the checkout lane. And I'm scanning the checkout lane. Who's my person I'm going to talk to? And I'm looking at the lines and I'm like, okay. And then I see the self-checkout and I'm like, she looks bored. So, and there's no one else there, so I go to the self-checkout. I'm scanning my vegetables. I'm like, okay, Lord, tell me when. And I get to the kale, and I look over there, and she's just, mm, yeah, bored. I said, ma'am, can you come here? She says, okay. I said, do you see that yellow flower? She says, yeah. I said, have you ever seen that before? No. Do you know what it means? No. And I said, that yellow flower, do you see how those petals are shaped like a cross and how delicate it is? And do you know this kale plant is part of the cruciferous family? And that's 12 of the most health-promoting vegetables you could ever eat. And that cross represents Jesus who died on the cross and the healing we get when we accept him as our Savior and we believe in him. And this is part of the plant that's going to bring the most healing to your body. Isn't that the most precious story you've ever heard? And she looked at me. She says, are you Catholic? Well, when we recognize the good that God's given us, then we're going to see those little precious fingerprints that God puts along our path. And he says, look, Annette, Annette I'm still here. I'm still your healer. You know, and I know you're all going to go home and look up what cruciferous means and what those 12 vegetables are, and I hope you do. But we wrote about them in the nutrition manual, so you don't have to go far. But we also need to eat foods as close to the way they were designed. Because that kale plant, plant is going to bring healing. But some foods, when we reach for them and they're, they're altered, we're settling for less than the good. So I'm going to give you a quiz today. I'm going to see if you can recognize the good versus the altered food. Now, it's going to be a quid, easy quiz because I kind of already have it separated here. <laughs> but anyway, okay, so let's just do the first one. So we have white distilled vinegar or we have apple cider vinegar. Obviously, you know, because I picked it from here, the apple cider vinegar would be a food closest to the way God designed it. The white distilled vinegar, I'm sorry to tell you, but if you've been using it, it's actually a petroleum product, and it's not healthy for you. Okay, so you might want to um, think about that. Okay, so let's try another one. You passed that one. Let's try, how about an orange drink? Oops, this is full. <laughs> Usually I use empty props. Um, versus Florida's orange juice. Good? Probably not. This one good? Okay, so it's close to I can get if I'm going to get a, if I'm going to buy an orange juice. Obviously, if you go out and pick your own oranges and, and juice it yourself, like I watched Sue Becker make those muffins that you're enjoying, and she did juice that orange for you, so you, you've got the really good stuff. So this is going to be my better choice, right? Closer to the way God designed it. Now, I realize you're not all going to juice your own oranges every morning, and so sometimes you might make a purchase, so that would be my better choice, right? Okay, let's see what else we have. We have um, a sweetener, or we have Red Becker's honey. <laughs> Easy one, right? But in my nutrition textbook, it says this is really close to a natural sweetener, and your body won't recognize the difference. What do you think? I think it knows what to do with this. Because scripture tells me it does, right? So this is going to be as close to the way God designed it. Actually, it's probably almost exactly like the way God designed it without any heat or alteration where this is my cells are going to say, yeah, that, you may think that's good, but that's not the best choice. Okay, so here we go. I should have mixed these up so you weren't so, it wasn't so easy for you. We've got the apple. We've got apple jack cereal. <laughs> and yeah, it's empty. <laughs> Don't ask me where it went. Um, there's no apple in this. And, if, and I grew up on this. And yeah, that pink sugar that comes out at the bottom of the box, if you've ate it, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that will really send you into an insulin problem. So this obviously would be our better choice. Okay, so what about, now this one stumps a few people. Get to the bottom of my grocery cart. You ever had that problem in the grocery store? Smart balance or organic butter. Is this not being preached to us? Do you know in about two or three years the recipe is going to change again? Because it's like, oops, that wasn't the perfect thing. Let's try it again. You know, and it probably has like 25 ingredients. You know, we need to think about what we're choosing. This is actually going to be the healthiest choice, even though I need very little of it, you know, for what I'm cooking. This is going to be a lab experiment. 
And you know, you need to think about that when you make a choice. And so you can kind of see some of my other examples up here. And I have the bread. Now, if you can see in front of me here, if you're on, in the, on watching by the internet, we have this beautiful loaf of bread. In fact, I almost wish I wasn't showing it because people who do my class, <laughs> they don't usually look that good. So I'm going to have to have Sue come to Virginia and help do some of my cooking classes. And so we have a choice of what bread we want to buy, right? We can make our own, which would be good, or we can buy bread in the store, right? What are we looking for in bread? What does Sue teach? Vitamins and minerals, right? But what's that one main thing that she gets hung up on? Fiber, exactly. You've heard her speak, right? So do you think the bread in the store has much fiber in it? What do you think? No? Do you think I could do this with Sue's loaf of bread? No, I can guarantee you I can't. So this means there's not much fiber in this bread, no matter what it says on the label. So you might just want to put it back up on the shelf and then run away quickly. <laughs> OK, so yes, we're looking for fiber. We're looking for vitamins and minerals. And the food closest to the way God designed it is going to give us that. The bread in the store, besides everything else that you might have learned through Sue or through the Treasures of Healthy Living, is not going to give us what our body can use. It's going to kind of get hung up you know, in several areas. And so this is just an idea how we can take the three principles. OK, I want to eat food as close to the way God designed it. So am I going to be making purchases in the grocery store? Yes, I am. There might be a time where I'm going to buy orange juice, or I'm going to buy butter, or apple cider vinegar. So I'm not going to make everything myself. OK, but when I do make those purchases, I'm looking for as close to the way God designed it. OK, principle number three is don't let any food become an addiction. And um, if you don't mind, I'm going to back up to principle number two, because I left out one point that I thought was very good. And one of the verses that go with it is it's Proverbs 14, 12. And it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death. The foods that we've been eating is what leads to all of these health problems. I mean, there's other problems that come into play, too. But in one of my textbooks, it's it calls this food, let me see if I can pull out a label for you, 100% vitamin C, you know, there's actually no oranges in here. Um, and all of these have labels, you know, this is going to give you a half a cup of vegetables in each serving. You, you can figure that one out on your own. You know, they're trying to play to your, they're trying to make a marketing deal here. OK, and in the textbooks, they call this functional food, OK, because it's designed to meet a function in your body. So they've labeled it functional food or even future foods. But here's the problem that even the textbooks say. They say research to determine the safety and effectiveness of these substances is still in progress. Until this work is complete, consumers are on their own to find out answers for these following questions. Does it work? How much of the ingredient are they claiming is actually in the product? Is it safe and is it healthy? Functional foods may be nothing more than a marketing tool. After all, even the most experienced researchers cannot yet identify the perfect combination of nutrients and phytochemicals to support optimal health. Yet manufacturers are freely experimenting with various concoctions as if they possessed that knowledge. And then it kind of says, um, if the present trend continues, the, the article um, in this section of the, of the textbook is talking about how they can design foods to meet whatever they want to do in your body. Well, God kind of did that in a very perfect way. But now they, they discover, OK, you know, the tomato has lycopene. So I'm going to take that, and I'm going to design this perfect packaged food so you get the lycopene that you need. Well, we could have just ate the tomato grown in our garden. And so scientists are learning so much about the foods that God created. And they say, if the present trend continues, someday physicians may be able to prescribe the perfect food to enhance the health, and the farmers will be able to grow them. Scientists have already developed the te gene technology to alter the composition of food crops. They can grow tomatoes with a hepatitis vaccine. Does that scare you a little bit? <laughs> it does me. OK, so 
it seems quite likely, and then it goes on to say that food can be created to meet every possible human need, but then, in a sense, he says, that we, that was largely, let me see, that was largely true 100 years ago when we, we relied on the bounty of nature. Man is trying to take what God created and find a way to benefit from it, and then they alter the food for you, and they're saying, we've designed this perfectly for you. This is where we get smart balance and things like that. But if we go back to the foods that God designed, we win, right? Okay, so that's principle number two. Principle number three, like I said, don't let any food become an addiction. John Piper says that what we hunger for, we worship. And there are many people who are addicted to food. I know I was, you know, and I still struggle with it every day. So we have to say, how am I going to break this addiction? So in the Bible study, there's one chapter totally devoted to fasting and how we can break these food addictions. But not only food addictions, what about work addictions? We've got people who are addicted to pornography. Even in our churches, they're on the Internet with this. There's a lot of addictions that we're dealing with. And even good food can become an addiction. So even if you're eating all the healthy food and all the healthy bread, you can still be addicted to it and, and taking it out of perspective to where it should be. You know, food is to give us health, but not to control us. You know, our whole life should not be focused on food. It should be focused on what can we do to be, on, be about God's mission. Okay, so those are the three principles. Eat the foods God called food. Eat them as close to the way he designed them. And don't let any food become an addiction. So many people have been on this journey, and I'm excited about how many people have started this journey. And the Treasures of Healthy Living Bible Study is just a guide to help you through the scriptures. It's not to interpret the scriptures. That's for you to discover on your own. But it is exciting that how Dr. Cooey and I have put this together. And so now I'm getting testimonies sent to me. Now remember, it's only been out since January. So in the spring class, these are some of the testimonies that came to me. Vicki writes, I feel so much better and I'm finally sleeping again. And Jim writes, in just these 12 weeks, my cholesterol has come down 20 points. Now, Janet, she wrote a precious testimony that still kind of chokes me up when I, when I know the, the lady who wrote this. She says, I've always had a love-hate relationship with food. I loved it because I used it to make me feel better, but I hated it more because of what it did to me, both physically and emotionally. And I hated myself as I ate it. Now I'm up early, feeling good all day long, and I feel 100% better. Isn't that a praise to the Lord? Liz writes, I've lost 12 pounds and no longer have insomnia. Ellen says, at the age of 65, I feel so much stronger, have more endurance than ever. I've completed my first 10K. And then Debbie writes, after completing the chapter on forgiveness, I knew God was leading me to do a fast and spend time praying for a situation from years ago. And then she says, I am now at peace. And there's more and more testimonies. I could just go on and on. This last one I want to share with you, though. Janine writes, the bread has given me an open door to witness to my friend. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the bottom line. Remember I said in the beginning, how would you describe your health? If you could use the word glorifying, that would be the ultimate blessing. To have a health that's glorifying to the Lord. Because someone's going to come up to you and they're going to say, you look so great. What are you doing? It's just like you have a glow about you. And you can say, well, I've been doing this new healthy living. Um, I've been studying this new healthy living book, and it's just been really great. But i got to go right now. I'll talk to you later. Do you know what she's going to do? Like, wait a minute. You didn't tell me the name of the book. What was the book? I wonder what she's doing. What could she be doing? What's the latest book out? And she's going to be watching you. Every time you come in contact with her, she's going to say, no. Now, wait a minute, you didn't tell me the name of that book. What's the book you're doing? And when the Holy Spirit prompts you to give her the answer, then give it to her. But if it's not time, let the Holy Spirit tell you. Because here's what you, you can say. You know what? I have found the greatest health book ever written. I cannot believe how good it is. And it's so simple. I got rid of complicated. Now it's simple. And, the, and then she's going to say, okay, tell me what it is. And like I said, under the Holy Spirit's prompting, you're going to say, oh, I just can't tell you the name. I've got to share it with you. Let's meet for a cup of tea. And when you meet with her, you take the health book that you've been following. Because it's not treasures of healthy living that makes the difference. It's God's word that makes the difference. 
You see, God has given us an open door. You know, many of you have learned different evangelism techniques, but now we can use the gift of health to witness to the world. And it starts with your health being glorified and people asking you, what are you doing? What is your church doing? I hear this buzz all around the community. Your church is up to something. Yeah. We got back into God's word for our health, and it is so exciting. The health changes personally are great, but the, action, the opportunity to witness to people. Can you, sharing food with people and t- telling people I teach you know, healthy living, I do cooking classes, all this stuff, has opened up so many doors to share the gospel I never imagined. People that wouldn't talk to me before, they're all like, hey, um, I heard about your soup class. Can I come? I'm like, yes. Just recently, I, I, I put out all these invitations in my neighborhood. I'm fairly new to our neighborhood, and I invited people to come to a bread class. There's no better way to share the gospel through, than over a loaf of bread. And, you know, doing this Treasures of Healthy Living, doing, just doing, reading the Bible and, and acquiring the health, is going to, to bring you to a, a state where you're going to be balanced, wise, and healthy. Like I said earlier, our churches are teaching such good knowledge about how to have a healthy marriage and how to have raise your children in a positive environment and how to tithe and the blessing of that and, and how to worship. But now our churches can open their doors and share the gift of health so that everyone can be balanced, wise, and healthy. We have a lot of lopsided Christians walking around because they're, they're good in so many areas but not their health. And now we can bring that area up to to an area that's glorifying to the Lord. And so, you know, i got to tell you, though, years ago, if I had experienced a lung problem and had to go through that kind of surgery and all of that, I would have just said, yeah, I tried that healthy living thing. It didn't work for me. I'm going to check that off my list. I'm going to move on to whatever's next. But now I know giving up on God's design is not an option. No matter what comes along my way, this is a plan that is truth, and it will lead us to the ultimate health plan that he's ever written. So I've got to ask you one more time. The scriptures say, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Are you ready to discover and experience the treasure of health? I see your heads nodding, so that, that's, I guess that's a yes. All right, well, I just want to thank you for letting me share that part with you. Um, And are there any questions? So now I'll go into the how to do this in your own church, but I'll start with a few questions first. Yes. Oh, well, yeah, join the group. Not GMO modified, it would be a different. Oh, yes, you're right. All right, thank you very much. Um, The question is about watermelon and grapes. Have you noticed we have seedless grapes now and seedless watermelons? You know, you can't have a good speed sitting, speed, (laughs) forget the words. You know what I'm talking about. You can't have a good speed, (laughs) seed spitting contest if you don't have seeds in your watermelon, you know? I mean, okay, so yes, but genetically GMO, we're hearing so much about corn, you know, and soy and all of that. That is when you take a different organism and cross it with the plant. What they're doing is kind of what people have been doing for years. Oh, I like the sweetness of this tomato and the firmness of this tomato, so they cross it. That's in the same species. You see what I'm saying? So a watermelon that's seedless is just being, you know, tweaked within the watermelon family and the grapes too. So it could be an organic food. It can be considered an organic food. It, it can be, yeah. Now, what the studies are showing that we're losing our nutritional value in our foods because of the ground, you know, everything. There's so much involved in it. But it's not a GMO. Yeah. Yeah. And see, I'm thinking they're so far away from the way God designed it, I just go for the seeded ones. Right, but that's why they can. Well, it's not a GMO, though. And yes, it can be organic. So yes, for a health food store to sell it, yes, that, that's what they're doing. We're just getting so far away from God's original design. Right, or grow it yourself, and then you know. <laughs> so, um, 
Okay, so today I want to jump into, now before I move any further, I want to step back and do a little housekeeping. Um, I have on this front table, if you want to pass it around, it's a sign-up sheet to be on my email newsletter. And so if you want to sign up, you can pass that around and you can do that. And they come out maybe every once or twice a month. If you don't, that's okay too. For those of you watching on the internet, you can just go online and say, you know, enter me in your e newsletter list. Okay, so if you want, that's right there in front of you ladies there. Okay, um, so let's talk about, and you can ask questions as we go, how can you do this Bible study in your church? Does it sound interesting to you? Does it sound like something you want to do? Well, I can guarantee you this is going to be the most unique Bible study that your church has ever done. Now, you've probably done some, some great Beth Moore studies and some, you know, Kay Arthur or some, there's some really good Bible studies out there, but when we bring in food, everything changes. So we have put together the Treasures of Healthy Living Bible Study. I probably should get this stuff out of the way. We've looked at that long enough. Okay. So this book here is the Bible study. Now you may look at it and say, well, that sure is thick. It's thinner than it was going to be. <laughs> That's all I can say. They kept editing out. I'm like, no, don't take any more out. But this is where we ended up. And it's going to take you all throughout all the scriptures and the different food groups. And it's actually a 12-week study. It's been divided into two parts. So you could do part one, first six weeks, and then another part two, the second six weeks. The first six weeks are about discovering all of the foods that God's designed for us and what does scripture say about it, okay? So you can fill up that treasure trust with all of the bounty that God's designed for you, all of the good, the excellent of its kind. And so it's going to walk you through that. Now the second six weeks is how to protect that treasure, okay? Because everyone's always trying to make you second guess. Have you ever done that? You read scripture and someone will say, well, that's not really what it means. People are always trying to make a second guess our decisions when we follow the Lord, but I always stick, I try to stick as close to the God's word as I can. So the second six weeks is about how to protect that treasure. So the second six weeks, we're going to go over fasting. We're going to go over exercise, scripture memory. Um, what else is in there? Forgiveness. <laughs> how can I forget? Forgiveness. And then a forgiveness week, oh, you're going to love it. Sue Becker comes and, bring, and does her testimony, and, and Jane Elder does too, and how forgiveness can just give you that freedom that we need as Christians. And then we also have sugar. It's actually in the second six weeks, not the first six weeks. And then it ends with your personal relationship with the Lord. And I got to tell you, there's a secret ending to this book, which I'm not going to reveal, but you have to find it out for yourself, but it's going to amaze you. So that's the Bible study. Now, as you go through the Bible study, there's going to be little excerpts that say, okay, you need to go to the nutrition manual and read more about garlic. Did you know that garlic, it, God designed it to be an antibiotic? And it kills not only the, it only kills the bad bacteria, not the good. Okay, so it's going to say, go in the nutrition manual and read about garlic. Or, and then one of our talks is about inflammation on the video series. Dr. Cooey does an excellent job on inflammation. It is our most requested talk. And so all of his notes are outlined in this book on inflammation. And so there's just so many topics in here. If you have children, it's like children's health is outlined in here. Women's health is outlined in here. Men's health. Um, how to have, oh, another chapter in, part, in the second part is on toxins. Toxins in our home and toxins in our mind and how that affects our health. And a lot of that, so it's in the Bible study. And then it may tell you to search deeper in the nutrition manual. If you were to take all of those rows and rows and rows of, of textbooks and health books that I have in my office, take them and filter them through scripture, what came through at the end that was still truth ended up in here, okay? There's some teaching out there that just doesn't match scripture, and so then I don't want to be focused on it. And then the third book is the cookbook. Don't we all love cookbooks? So if, for some people who are starting this journey, this is all brand new to them. So the first chapter is on, you know, the ingredients. <laughs> what does it mean, honey crystals? What does that mean? You know, what is real salt? Why is that important to me? Um, and how to choose better dairy products, how to choose, you know, how to make your own broth, you know, just different things like that. But don't let that scare you because some of the recipes are really easy and really simple that you can make anytime. Like the black bean soup is three ingredients. It's so easy. You can throw it together in like 10 minutes and have a great dinner. 
so recipes for the beginner, you know, and the experienced. People who are brand new into eating healthy and people who have been in it a long time, both of them love the book. So those are the three books that I recommend. Some churches will just do the Bible study and, and just offer that. Some churches will say, you need all three. When I come in and teach, it's like, oh, you need all three. It's like, these are like your children. You know, like, I can't imagine you giving up one of your children, you know, so you've got to have all three. And then we put together um, a leader guide. I've been teaching these classes for over seven years, and people you know, all around the country are like, well, how do I do that? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Um, so I put all my teaching notes in the leader guide and said, here, <laughs> this is exactly how I do it. And so it'll say, you know, this week I want you, it'll say, here's your agenda. It's kind of laid out your welcome, your prayer and praise tickles, your review, the video, turn on the video. It's, the introduction is three minutes. And then, then it'll give you some review questions. Here's the answer you're kind of looking for. Or sometimes it'll say it's their own idea, their own answers. It's all laid out for you. Now, here's how the classes normally work. You can, obviously you can do whatever you want. We have some people who are doing it in their workplace. They're doing it during their lunch hour. So time is a little bit limited there. So um, you can do it however you want to make it fit in your program. Um, but typically my classes are two hours. So we meet for 13 weeks for two hours. Okay, it's 13 because you have like an introductory class to kind of explain it all to them. And then the last week, week number 13, which um, the group I was teaching just ended last night, is the banquet. Everyone gets to bring guests and have a great you know, feast and, and just really look at what they've learned throughout this time. And so, um, so it's 13 weeks. Okay, how is it laid out? I was trying to figure out where I was going with that. Okay, so when they come in, we do a review of the lesson, and then we pause for like 10, 15 minutes, and we have our taste and see time. And either, like the first three weeks as the leader, you might bring in food yourself to kind of help them get accustomed to it. And, and, ex and so you might make a food. Like if it's a smoothie, I'll make it in front of them. I'll bring in my Vitamix or my blender and make a smoothie in front of them and let them taste it. And, and I always tell people, like, this is how I get my husband to eat his vegetables, okay? And he's back there and he'll agree. I'll, when he comes home from dinner, like, do you want to eat your vegetables or drink them? He's like, I'll drink them. He doesn't like vegetables. So I'll throw in the kale or the spinach and, you know, all these different vegetables and some fruit. And so they're good. He's good to go with his vegetables. And so I'll make that smoothie, and all of a sudden they realize, oh, well, my kids would eat this or drink this. So different week, we'll focus on different foods. And so I've got ideas laid out for here, but you can do whatever you want. So we'll pause for our taste and see time and experience the food, and then we'll end with a health topic or which is on video so we have the video series now so you have a video for each week it's kind of like if you're familiar with the Beth Moore study you know you have your review and then you pop in the video and on the video series we have Dr. Cooey comes in and, and speaks like I said on inflammation and exercise and then Sue Becker is one of our guest speakers on forgiveness um, we have several other guest speakers and then I do a lot of the teaching too and it really kind of just pulls it all together how do we apply it to today's culture you know where we live today and then that's how it works. Now, one more thing, and then I'll let you ask more questions. Um, we've just come out with, and this is, all of these things are available on breadbeckers.com, or if you're here in the store. This one is brand new, and we don't have it printed yet, so it'll be coming soon. But this is called the Teacher's Manual. For those of you, we are having Christian schools who are wanting to offer this program. We're having homeschool groups that are wanting to offer this program. So this is a teacher's manual with lots of um, really, she, the, I didn't put this together, a homeschooling mom did, and she added all kinds of neat activities. So kids of all ages can do this Bible study and learn from it. Because we're actually teaching, we're teaching Bible, we're teaching history, we're teaching cooking, we're teaching health science, all of this all in one. So it's a tremendous resource. So homeschool groups, you know, schools, you know, whatever. So anyone, whether you're an individual and you want to do it on your own, can just buy the books and the video series. Or if you are a family, you want to do it together as a family. January 1st is right around the corner. What a great way to start the new year. Or your church could offer it. It's, it's so versatile, it, it just amazes me. So Okay, so what questions would you have about hosting a class like this or just doing it on your own? Yes, ma'am. Right? Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You could. You just need to, I mean, I don't recommend it because they, each chapter works on the others. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to repeat the question. The question is this. She says at her church, they have found that eight weeks is the maximum that women are willing to put, you know, to keep attending for a Bible study because people, you know, it starts, you know, waning off after that. So could this work in an eight-week session? Um, you could. I don't recommend it because every chapter builds on each on the others, and you just don't know which chapter is the chapter some of those ladies need. Like, do you leave out forgiveness? I don't know. Or do you leave out toxins? But but here's the idea. That's why we divided it into two six-week sections. So if you wanted to say, hey, let's do part one right now, and let's come back and do part two later, we could divide it up. That would be about, it's a six-week study, so that would be about seven and seven. You know, if you had a little intro or a little banquet at the end, you could do that. Um, and I have experience with my classes that the first Four to five weeks, we keep growing and growing and growing because the word gets out. Because it's so unusual, people don't know what to think. In fact, um, I was at a women's conference just two days ago, and I was sitting at the table, and she's like, oh, I heard about your study, I, but I thought it was kind of like, um, oh, I was going to have to grow a garden, and I was going to do all these things. But then when I, after I heard the ladies going through it, I'm sorry, I didn't take it. She's like, this is so much more. And I'm like, that's what everyone says. This is so much more. So... I'm, what I'm experiencing and have experienced for years is people keep adding in the first five weeks, and they do make it to the end because the excitement keeps building. What keeps bringing them back, though, the trick is that taste and see time. <laughs> the time involvement outside of class. For the leader, okay, let's just start with the, with the student. Um... <laughs> do I say that? Um, some people say, Annette, this is like a college class. <laughs> and other people say, it's not. You know, it depends on what they're wanting to get out of it. I would say you're going to spend a minimum, a minimum of two hours a week studying the Bible study. The first chapter is the very longest, and after that they get, they're much shorter, and they just kind of, you fall into a pattern. A minimum of two hours, I would say you might even spend three hours if you're going to do both books, reading all the material. It's divided into five days, so they can work through it each day. But some people, and even myself sometimes when I get behind on a Bible study, I'm like, okay, i got to hurry up and get this in. Now, we also encourage you every week to do a recipe. So that's a different time frame. You know, how am I going to fit this recipe in, buying the ingredients? So that would be more time involved. Now, as a leader, because we have it very well, laid out in the leader guide, we've tried to cut down on your time to lead a class. But the first time going through it, it is different. Okay, now i got to think about food to bring to class, you know, things like that. And um, You're going to spend more time, I would think, probably double that the first time you lead it. After that, you'll kind of have it down, like, oh, I got this figured out. This is good, you know. So that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking is the time frame involved. Yes, ma'am. Oh, what is the cost involved? Okay, the leader guide is sixteen ninety five. The DVDs are eighty nine ninety five. Okay, the student book. Yes, this is the Bible study. The Bible study it, it retails for twenty one ninety nine, but it's discounted to eighteen ninety nine. And these are all on Breadbecker's website and in their store here. The nutrition manual is another eighteen ninety nine, and then the cookbook is sixteen fourteen. Okay, okay. So, and then we also have for some people they're like, I just want to do it on my own. I don't have time to watch videos. We've taken all of the videos, all of the the video portion, and put it into CDs. And so we have a CD set if people just want. I just need to listen to it while I'm driving, and those are thirty nine ninety five. question is, <laughs> not usually the first question I like to answer <laughs> in public, um, the question is, how does the Bible study address shellfish and pork? you got to read it in the Bible and apply it, and that's your answer. <laughs> what scripture says is good. And the Bible study will help to show people why it's good. God created everything 
for a reason. And when we let things work as he designed, our oceans are cleaned up, you know, all kinds of, everything works well. But some foods were never called food for us, but we just seem to eat it anyway. Um, and we go straight with scripture. But here's what I will say on that. I don't let any food or decision that I make become a stumbling block to anyone else, and I will never let it interfere with the fellowship that I have with other people. But am I going to follow Scripture? Yes, I'm going to follow Scripture. Does that answer your question? All right, thank you. So, yes, ma'am. You can, the question is, can you do the Bible study without the addition of the CDs and the DVDs? The answer is yes. It, all three of these books are standalone books on their own. They're very valuable in themselves. Now, we just did this filming this past spring, so it's all fresh in my heart, and I'm saying, why would you want to? <laughs> you know? uh, so, yes, when money's a factor, yes, you can get started with this, but then just put it on that Christmas list. You know, share with your family, I want this, you know, because I'm telling you, they're, they're listening and they're re-listening and they're re-listening to some of these talks, and um, it's just going to amaze you. Yes, any other questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the, the comment from Sue Becker in the back is, is saying that, yes, the CDs are very convenient when we don't have time to watch a video. And what we're experiencing, though, is people are going through the class and, and if you do lead a class, I mean, we just kind of split that cost of the $90 for the DVDs up among the different members, and it comes out to be hardly any, you know. And for, in, in comparison to other studies that are out there, when you buy full leader kits, I mean, they're, we've tried to price them extremely reasonable as we can so that the message can get out there. So, yes, sir. Okay, the question is, we're not addressing... <laughs> Sue, you want this one? <laughs> the question is, he understands what the Bible says about pork. The question is, what about turkey bacon? Well, you know, I use turkey sausage in a lot of my recipes, but we also put a recipe in the cookbook on how to make your own turkey sausage, and it, is, it tastes great. Um, I just, I'm very particular where I'm buying my meat from. That's the first thing. You know, I like the connection between the farmer and me or as close as I can get to that farmer, either from the supplier or whatever, so that I know I'm getting a good quality. It's been raised the way God designed. That's my first thing on any meat. And then, um, yes, you can keep coming up here <laughs> if, you wanted to add, if you wanted to add to this. So that's my first thing. How's it being raised so that I'm going to get the health benefit? The second thing is I don't need as much as I thought I did of meat. I only need, you know, a smaller portion than what I used to eat. And bacon... Um, I don't give my husband bacon anymore because I haven't found a good supplier of turkey bacon. So instead we do turkey sausage. For me, it's all about that connection with the farmer and how he's raising it. And I haven't found a good healthy turkey bacon. There might be some out there. I just haven't found any. Um, I don't like a lot of the chemicals that are used to make bacon. That's my hang-up. You know, I'm trying to find the best possible. When you get off prescriptions and you don't want to go back there and you've had cancer in your household and you don't want to go back there, you're a little bit more particular about what you bring into the home. You know, some of us think we're, you know, we can do anything and health, you know, health problems will never come, but they're going to come, but so we need to be very active and proactive. And I, and I want to set a good example, you know, um, for others. Did you want to add anything to that? Okay. <laughs> Well, I don't buy any of my meat in a grocery store. I get it all from co-ops uh, because they are getting it straight from the farmer. And those are listed in the back of the books as far as resources. If you go to localharvest.com, no matter where you live in the United States, you can usually find a supplier. Becoming more and more prevalent as we go because this is becoming very popular. Um, so I haven't found a good turkey bacon that supplier that I like. I, so I can either buy it pre-made, pre ready to go, or I can make my own, just getting, you know, ground up turkey, 
that I can buy and then seasoning it and letting it sit in the refrigerator for 24 hours and I've got turkey sausage. Yeah, in, uh, in my red cookbook, the Bread Becker's recipe collection, there's a recipe for turkey sausage in there. And that's what I use for, I buy the ground turkey and then I season it how I want it. But it's in, it's in our red cookbook. And then I make sausage patties and sausage gravy and I use it on my pizzas or whatever. And we're so, not missing anything in life, are we? Not missing a thing. <laughs> so, but, and, and I will add this as far as your turkey bacon and that kind of stuff. I feel exactly the way um, Annette does. A lot of times people say, well, I'm not going to eat pork and some of these other things. And then they go to these alternative foods that are laden with chemicals. <laughs> and they think that they're eating healthy, and that's not necessarily so. So we still need to be careful, you know, about those those things, I mean, that's like people say, well, you know, I want to become a vegetarian, and they go and eat all the, the soy and fake meat products. I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, that, you know, so we just need to be careful, and not everything you buy in the health food store is healthy, just so you know. Most, when we went to the Natural Products Expo, it was a whole convention center, most of the stuff there was not healthy. It was not, which is interesting. Um, and just because it says it's organic doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy either. A lot of times you have organic white flour and white sugar, and <laughs> that's not healthy. But I, I know that for our family, we took things one step at a time. If your family loves bacon, I would certainly maybe, you know, still, you know, get some beef bacon or turkey bacon or whatever, do these other things. But eventually, you'll you'll get there. If you go in and just try to wipe everything out of your kitchen at one time, particularly if you have young children at home, you're probably going to get revolt on your hands. <laughs> and I mean, they're going to just go, huh. but that's why I love the bread. Starting with the bread, I think it's just phenomenal because you eliminate <laughs> a whole realm of unhealthy foods by just introducing that grain and getting your body cleaned out. And, and I tell people all the time, if you never made another change, to the way you were eating, and you only change the bread, which you're not, because you're going it's just gonna get you so excited about how healthy you are, you're gonna go to the next level. But you would see incredible health benefits, and, and your family won't revolt, because you can make delicious muffins and cookies and things. Sorry. No, you're good. Any other questions? I wanna share with you, um, there was a church in Colonial Heights, Virginia, that did this study um, this past spring, and they're sort of part of the video series in, in a small way, but you know, they're realizing this has given them an opportunity to reach out to the neighborhood. In fact, a couple of the ladies are getting ready to start their own cooking ministry because women don't know how to cook anymore. And they're gonna use that as an outreach. There's a group in Ohio that has done this study. They're starting a bread ministry. They're gonna teach people to come in and learn how to make bread as their outreach. You know, we've tried man's ways and we just need to introduce people to God's ways and use that as an outreach. We have so much to offer people by keeping focus on God's Word. There's so much that can be done with God's Word or the Treasures Healthy Living Bible Study. That, you know, all these years, other groups have been leading the health movement. And we Christians were like, I'm saved by grace. I can eat whatever I want. You know, and it hasn't worked for us. We should be leading the health movement. We should have been leading it all along. Now we're trying to kind of catch up speed, but we've had the answer all along. We've had God's word. Now we get to use it to reach out to our communities and to, to our, our neighbor next door. Can you imagine how it's, what it's going to be like when you have the energy and vitality to be on mission for God wherever he calls you, whether it's just across the street or across the, the state or across the country or across the world? You can do that when you have the health that you need to, to accomplish that. So, yes, ma'am. The question is about, <laughs> the question is, where do you go for supplements? And, and that's a whole nother lesson. So we'll just, <laughs> so I don't really have a, an answer for you. I mean, I have ones that I like, and I'm sure Sue has some that she likes, and Dr. Cooey has his favorites. So, you know, you can talk to us, you know, individually, but as far as a general answer, as smart as we're getting about our food, I want to be just as smart about my supplements. I'm not going to drop my guard when it comes to supplements. Yes, I'm not going to go to Walmart, Costco, to buy supplements because I have now raised the standard of what's allowed in my home. So I'm going to be very particular about what supplements I use. So, yes. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm.
It can be, yes, I agree. The question was this. I, she homeschools, single income, very tight budget. And I totally get that. And sometimes you can only take out of your budget so much because it's already as lean as can be, right? Okay, so it's not like I, like when my husband and I started this, I was working full time and we were eating out a lot. Well, that was easy. We'll just cut out the eating out. That gave us the budget I needed to afford what we needed to do. And yes, sometimes organic can be expensive, but I'm telling you that God's word always comes through. And when you present it to the Lord, Lord, I just, I feel like this is of you. Show me how to make it work. I can guarantee you he will. He will provide. One of my, the, my favorite mentors in my life, her name is Betty Moeller, and she's now in Russia as a missionary. And she said, she said, Annette, when you go back and you study the Depression era, those who depended on God were never in line for bread. God always supplied their needs. And he tells us over and over, he will supply our needs. I don't know where the resources are going to come. But I'm saying if you make it a prayer commitment to the Lord, he will supply your needs. And it may come from all over the place. You know, but I know Sue would work with you. I'll work with you. Whatever we can do to help you get it. You know, some people buy this um, as a download. And then, you know, if it's in the family, you can share it, but not as a church, obviously. Um, you know, there are ways of making it work. But you know what? I got tired of buying herbs in the store because they were so expensive. So I started growing my own. You know, I only had to make a one-time purchase, and now my rosemary is all over the place, and so is my oregano and my thyme, you know. And so now I just run outside, clip my, my herbs, and come in and make my dish. So I save a little money there. I save a little money in just, like, making the bread is, I mean, it, it's very cheap to make bread once you make that investment. I mean, it, it's cost you, like, maybe, I don't know what your figures are. I figure it's like a dollar, dollar ten a loaf max to make a loaf of bread that's going to cost me, this type of bread in the store is going to cost me five or six dollars. You know, but the health benefits. You know, I had one lady who says, you know, Annette, we no longer have Zingler, Zingler, Claritin, none of those prescriptions. She said, in this year alone, she says, We've, we have not had any doctor visits. Those were $20 each time for the copay, not to mention the prescription, even though they're fairly cheap. She says, right there, we saved $100 out of our budget. And she's a homeschooling mom on single income. I don't, I don't know how God's going to work it out. All I can tell you is his word says he will when we follow his principles. I've got to jump in here. <laughs> As a homeschooling mom of nine children and um, single income when we started, um, I guess you can call this the double income now because we both work very hard here. But um, And I encourage you, after the first of the year in January, I will do a four-week um, Healthy Eating Simplified class. And one of the first things that I go over, and I'm sorry I don't have my little charts here for you to show you, but I totally dispel the myth of healthy eating um, being more expensive than, than unhealthy eating. Um, you know, maybe like pick up this little, let me have, hold this. I don't know how much this costs, but I'll show you a box of cereal, like uh, Frosted Flakes or one of the cereals. It says on the box that there's 12 servings in that box. I almost crack up laughing. You would never put that one box of cereal on the table to feed 12 people and it costs like $4, you can make a dozen muffins out of freshly ground whole grain that would fill up 12 people. Real food is filling, and you can make it for a couple of dollars. Do you see the difference? I know when my children were young, before we started bread, I would buy, and I bought the best bread I could buy in the grocery store. I would make the whole loaf into peanut butter sandwiches or whatever, cut them in half, and they would fight over the last ones, the whole loaf. After we started making bread with five children at that time, I made five sandwiches, cut them in half. There was always sandwiches left, pieces left. It's a big difference. This is going to fill them up much more than that bag of chips that cost two or three dollars. You know, and I, and I, so I, I lay all these analogies out. Water is much cheaper than juice and, and soft drinks. It's, it really is not more expensive. I know what you're thinking when you buy organic versus non-organic, and yes, I can, I can see that there. Um, you know, you've got to make those choices. There's, I, I don't know if Annette has in her book, I can't remember now, of, you know, the top 10 that you definitely, fruits and vegetables, that you want to buy organic. And the rest, you know, you can wash and use veggie wash and some of these things to get, get those things off. Um, but we have a, 
we have a organic produce co-op. I'm loving it. I, I'm just loving it. That meets here one, uh, that delivers here once a week, um, where you buy your box of produce. But it really is not. And then nine children. Well, my last two have been adopted in the last two years. But so, okay, a family of nine in the last 20 years since we started milling our wheat, making our bread, and eating this way, we've only had to go to the doctor three times in those 20 years, my children. And we've had no antihistamines or decongestants of any kind. And before we started, soon as fall hit, I bought my bottle of, you know, Dimetap or whatever was the, you know, antihistamine decongestant liquid for the kid. No, we don't buy that. Um, I, I don't know the last time I had a headache, don't remember, don't remember, and I used to get migraines. Um, my children rarely need ibuprofen, and I do have two teenage girls with cycles, you know, so they get a little, every now and then I'm like, take some ibuprofen, you just need it. Maybe I need to take the ibuprofen, but anyway. <laughs> but you, do you hear what I'm saying? I mean, it, this is huge, this is huge when we're just healthy, and this real food fills you up. Margarine may be cheaper, but butter is going to satisfy, and you're not going to use as much. It's, it's amazing. It really, really is amazing. And um, so I just want to encourage you there. I, I live in a 1,300-square-foot, three-bedroom house with a million kids and a husband, and, and you can do it. I mean, it, and it, is, it will pay for itself 100 times over. It's it's amazing and it's it's not expensive. You can get 63 loaves of bread out of a $37 bucket of wheat. That'll last the average family about a month and a half or two months. And that's making all your own bread, cakes, cookies, brownies, muffins, pancakes. So it, I I just can't say enough. But I'll dispel the, those those myths. Um, when you see you know what that bag of Cheetos that's supposed to feed, you know, three or four servings as opposed to buying a container of cantaloupe for less, which is going to fill them up more and they can share, or a salad or a bag of apples or pears or bananas you can buy cheaper than that bag of chips or crackers or, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It, it, it will open your eyes to, wow, it's not expensive. It's not more expensive. I know. I know. And, I, and I'm the same place there, and I pick and choose. I've started cream. Cream and butter, I'm going organic because toxins are stored in fat. So I'm going organic there. And I just started one at a time. Now, now well, my daughter raises eggs, so I buy her. I mean, she raises chickens, so I get eggs. But if I have to buy them in the grocery store, I used to buy just whatever eggs. But I'm just making the next step. Now I buy organic. And, and I haven't seen, I know what you're saying, but just go one step at a time in that realm. But make some, make some priorities. And for me, the first place was my butter, cream, and my milk because of, of the things that happened there. <laughs> okay. So, and just make one step at a time. Any other questions? Yes. Local meat? The question um, is, where can we buy a local meat? Where can we buy local meat? I know that um, we have a flyer out in the store, a lady up in the Jasper Ball Ground area, I can't remember now, that raises chickens. So I know where you can get chickens. I don't um, have a great source right now for, um, for beef. I know, I know there's some, and it just, it just evaded me. So, um, but there's, there's places that you, that you can find them. Localharvest.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Local. Say it again. Localharvest.com. So, um, yeah. And I know there's some that we get from personally, but they're not like where everybody can can get things from. So, but I know there's some around. Um, you know, and I just. You know, I do the green wise or the organic or things like that when I go to the grocery store. Oh, 
Um, cottage cheese milk, I mean, again, my dairy, I try to go organic there, particularly if it's a high fat. That's why we, and raw, raw if you can. Um, unfortunately, raw milk has been legislated that you can't purchase it other than for pet consumption. Um, so, interesting. But um, we do carry raw milk cheese here and uh, yogurt cheese. If it's a process, the question is, should we be eating the cottage cheese and everything that's out in the store, all of the dairy that's in the store? And the answer is, it's extremely altered. It's extremely altered beyond what your body can deal with. And so, yes, if you can find a raw cheese or an organic cheese or, you know, cheese and cottage cheese, and it's just very disappointing because we've been taught so much of our life, oh, we've got to have this dairy, we've got to have this calcium, but... The studies show that the calcium that they are putting into that dairy, which they have to put into because they've eliminated all the nutrients, is not a calcium that can be absorbed, which is why we are the leading country in osteoporosis and vitamin D deficiency, because it's not being absorbed because of the dairy that's out there, because it is so altered beyond God's design. Is it good and healthy for us in God's design? Totally. You can't beat it. But in man's alteration, we lose. And there are raw milk co-ops um, around. I think you can go on, I think it's called rawmilk.com. I think you can find local. Uh, again, I would, go, I would go with an organic. And now, you know, the grocery stores are, you know, they, ha they are offering organic products now in, in the, pardon me? Uh, that's a whole wow. That's a whole. You got some great questions. Well, yeah. That's a whole nother thing. Yes, I mean the question, I've read yeah. there the, like organic yogurt. Or, you know, I've I've read some things. So, but you know, we got to just take it one step at a time. Do the best you can do. Pray without ceasing. God will give you wisdom. He will lead you and guide you. Psalm thirty-two eight, I think, says, "I the Lord." will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. The secret is start, take one step at a time, and God will lead you. I remember, I remember when we first started, um, we did not differentiate between clean and unclean meat. We saw significant health benefits. And then later, when we met Dr. Russell, we, we learned to differentiate. And then lay, I remember the day I was like, I want to drink, you know, unpasteurized milk and it but it was years after we had started our bread god mm -hmm. will lead you he will lead you this is a journey you don't just you know what's the uh, beam me up you know scotty i would love to just be beamed from one location to another but that's not reality and it's the same with i love An annette's um analogy this is a journey this is we're we're on a trip and um there's going to be a little bumps and, and lumps along the way, and there's going to be a little compromises here and there. I do it. I'm sure Annette does it. Um, I think my passion this holiday season has been to show you that you, ha you don't have to compromise as much as you think, you know, with these holidays coming. Some of y'all were in the Thanksgiving. How many of y'all were in the Thanksgiving class? I'm digressing here a little bit. You see, I mean, you can, you can have healthy foods. The Christmas class, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to show you how you don't have to make as many compromises as you think you do, but when you're fellowshipping with other people that maybe don't have your convictions and things like that, there's going to be some bumps and little journey. I think it's filled, yes. We have, I think we're at 110, 110 people for that class. Um, Whatever is available to you, think about this logically for a minute. What do you think they made yogurt out of way back when? Okay. A lot of things are in print because people have to cover their bases. I mean, come on, really, really, really. That's just like mm -hmm. somebody t was talking about white rice, orientals, you know, it's like, well, we can't make it out of brown rice. And I'm like, Really? What do you think that they made it out of years, I mean, you know, years ago? So think logically. Just, you know, 
tell you like Dr. Denmark, she's just precious Dr. Denmark. Y'all know who Dr. Denmark is? 100 and how many years old? 13, I think now, or maybe even more than that. And um, she said, you are smart. God gave you a brain, and we just need to use it. And so oftentimes we read the experts or we go to the doctor and they tell us that there's no other option. Really? You know, you, you've got a brain, so just think about it. Um, well, you can make it really, really easily, cheaply. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Maybe you can. I don't want to. I'm sorry. I'm skipping You're over. But um, you just jump in if you know more than me. She probably knows more than me on a lot of things. Um, you know, I don't know about all the, pro you know, the r almond milk, rice milk, soy milks that are in the store. I do. That's interesting that they're in a carton that sits on the shelf. Hmm. So, um, you know, that tells me that somehow they've been processed. But we have the Soyabella um, soy milk. Well, it's built as a soy milk maker. So easy to make almond milk, rice milk yourself for pennies. I, I think soy milk is like 75 cents a gallon. I never priced out the almond milk to see how much cheaper. And it's as easy as putting on a pot of coffee. You just put them in there. It grinds it and percolates the hot water through it, and you've got it. So that's the way it's made. It's just by... Um, percolating the water over the ground um, rice or soybeans or almonds. So the real thing that you make yourself is not that process. You know, what you buy in the store, I don't know. And there again, you know, there's another thing. I mean, yes, that initial investment of the machine, but, man, if you have to drink alternative milks, we're talking pennies you can make your own rice milk and, you know, things like that. Oh, it's always preferable. I, yeah, I love, yes. If you can get If it. you can get it. It's, to me, it's, yes. you know. Of course, if you have dairy allergies, then, you know. And some people don't when they go to the raw. Mm -hmm. They don't have those issues at all. Other, other people do. They still have, have issues. It's not as prevalent as what you, you have been taught to believe. And if you know the supplier, mm -mm. no, if you know the supplier, and I even encourage people, visit the farm where you're getting it from. See how they're handling their cows and their equipment and things like that. And if it's clean, the milk's going to be good. You know, it's kind of what we've been taught that, oh, you can't trust it, you know. There again, what Scripture says, it's good for me. So, you know, I want a small farm. I don't want a farm with... 10,000 cows. You know what I mean? I want someone who's controlling and they know how they're raised. They're taking care of them. It's a clean facility. Then I, I, the, the milk that comes from there, that's good to drink, as is. And the beauty of it is <laughs> the cream rises to the top. You take it off, you throw it in the blender, and you got your own butter. You get two for the one. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been using raw milk for probably 18 years. Nothing wrong with me. Hang on, because I don't think we'll be able to repeat it. So. She wants to give a word. Um, my grandparents were married in 1904, and when they were married, my <clears throat> granddaddy's father had already passed away. He was the oldest of nine children, and then right after they were married, his mom died. She was 44 years old when she died. Uh, my grandparents were both 17 when they were married. Anyway, they took all his little brothers and sisters in to raise. And then they had seven children of their own. And they lived close around here. And this was in the 1920s up to 1920. And anyway, they, at that time, my grandmother knew something was bothering my grandfather. She didn't know what it was, but something was bothering him. And he said to her, he always called her Gal, his Gal. He said, Gal, you know, we're just not making it here as a farm family. We need to move over to Alabama where his brother lived and live with Henry for a while and, you know, get settled because they were having children. 
and you know we got to feed this family <clears throat> and my grandmother Millie said they went and for two years they almost starved to death and finally he came and he said well let's go back to Georgia back to our own farm and they came and they were going by horse and buggy up Canton Road right out here and when they got, and some of you will know where it is, near 2-9 Baptist Church, he stopped the horse and buggy, and he told her, hold the reins. And he went off in the woods, and she thought he was going to the bathroom. And he was gone and gone and gone. And so she was in the buggy with all these kids, and she told her oldest son, Son, I'm afraid your daddy has gotten on a snake. Go find him. So he went and found his dad, and he was on his knees, and he had been praying, and he came back, got on the buggy, and he, my grandmother said, I knew something had happened. He was different. And she said, well, Vess, his name was Sylvester, what's happened? He said, well, Gail, I told the Lord, I knew he had called me to preach many years ago, and I turned him down because I had all these kids. And I said, there's no way I can do that. And so we went away, and now we're back. And the closer I get to home, the heavier my burden is. So finally I couldn't bear it, and I went and I said, Lord, I will do anything you tell me to do if you won't let us starve. <laughs> and he went on then back to the old farm place, apprenticed himself, for lack of a better word, to a minister, studied the Bible, and, and worked as, and became a minister of a church for years and years until he died in 1960. <clears throat> But I want that story is preface to this. During the Depression, the little community and his church, you know, were just really hard hit. But on their farm, they raised enough food. My grandmother was a master gardener. She had acres of corn and peas and tomatoes and you name it. They fed the entire community. For years, not only their own family, but the whole community of hundreds of people. And my grandmother got seven cows and milked them and made butter and cottage cheese and stuff like that and provided all of that for years and years and years and never made die off any of it and it's because of God's faithfulness God's faithfulness because he made the commitment and my grandmother already knew a lot of, about how to take care of the cows and how to grow crops and so forth and so if you commit yourself to this word it will come back and bless you and your family for generations to come because I've seen it. I heard the story since the time I was a little kid. That was my grandmother's testimony, my granddaddy's testimony. But God is faithful to generation after generation. Yes, he is. <laughs> you've enjoyed having Annette and I just want to just pray yes a blessing on her and on your day we'll let Annette um, will sign books if you want to purchase books I just want to thank you for coming I just want to encourage you what a word what a testimony to leave that on and I encourage you all just start let God begin to show you I the Lord will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go he will counsel you with his eye upon you. And if you will be faithful to obey him, he will bless and he will provide and he will make a way. And um, if we just make that step, one step at a time, 
okay? Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. And we just thank you for Annette and the, the wisdom that she has put together in a book. I just pray a blessing on her and her husband that you would strengthen them, give them rest from their journeys, and, and um, I just, just thank you for her. And all that she's done, her passion to encourage and to teach and to share with others comes through in every word. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to lead and guide us. We, actually, we thank you that you promised that you will and that your word says you will give us wisdom and that you will bless us. Lord, in our goal is not just to be healthy, but it is to be a glory and, and a light in, of your name to this dark and depraved generation. And I just pray that we would be a testimony in everything we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.